started. So I want to talk today about constrained optimization. So let's start with an example of constrained optimization and this example is coming from the book. It's called multi-commodity flow problem and it's quite useful. So let's review what this example is. Okay, so the idea is as follows. You have several nodes. Okay, one of them is input node. And you have directed edges between the nodes. And you have an output node. And you have RW units of uh, commodity that you want to send from input to output. Okay, and you can think of this as, as roads, uh, a road network of some sort. Okay, and you have RW units of good that you want to send across these, uh, through these road networks to this output node. Okay, or it could be a data packet I mean RW units of data packet that you want to uh, route to your destination through uh, use of uh, several uh, transmission channels. Okay, so what would be so this is this is input, and of course you want the output to be same as input. Okay, so there is no loss of packet, so there is no loss of commodity within the network. Uh, there are some networks where there is some loss. So for instance, if you are thinking about electricity, okay, and these are transmission lines, you might have losses in the transmission lines. But in this case, in the multi-commodity flow problem, there is no loss whatsoever in, on, these, uh, on these directed edges. So what would be a reasonable goal here? Okay, so, so the first thing, what are the, what are the optimization variables? So the optimization variables here are how many packets you want to send through each of these routes. So this is, say, x1. This is x2. This is x3. And this is x4, OK? So, so this RW will be divided into four components. And each of those components will go through one of these routes. Okay, so x1 will go through this. So this, uh, let's say, this is one, two, three, four, five. So x1 will go through one, two, five nodes, one, two, five, and then x2 will go through one, three, no, one, two, three, five, and so on. Okay. So what would be a reasonable goal? Uh, suppose you are, you are the manager of a Walmart chain and you have some commodity at some uh, you know, set of commodities in some warehouse somewhere else. Uh, what would your reasonable goal, and this is the Walmart store that you are manager of, what would be a reasonable goal for you? Uh, do we have constraint? Uh, mm. At this point of time, there's no constraint. Yeah, but yes, that's an important point. You can have constraint over these routes, but for this particular problem, assume that there are no constraints whatsoever. As fast as you can. So what would you want to minimize? Time, delay. Yeah, so in this case, you, uh, you have a single cost function. That's a function of x. So my x is x1, x2, x3, x4, OK? 
So you want to minimize the delay, which is a function of x, and it depends on the delay. The, this function would depend on a lot of other factors. Okay, so we'll we'll see what uh, kind of delay uh, might make sense in some sen in some cases, uh, but but this is the minimization problem. What are the constraints on these x's? What sort of constraints should you put on these x's so that it doesn't become some arbitrary problem. So of course, x is in R4 here. x is in R4. But what, what are the constraints? Should be positive or 0. So x has to be greater than or equal to 0. What else? Summation. So 1 transpose x, which is the same as xi i equals 1 to 4. That should be what? Rw, right? So that's a reasonable, uh, uh, I mean, the commodities have to add up to Rw, right? So that's a, a reasonable uh, restriction. And so this becomes your constraint optimization problem. So now my question is, suppose I define x as the set x in Rn such that x is greater than or equal to 0 and summation of xi is equal to some d. No, d is already used. R, is this a convex set? So question is, is x convex? Okay, how would we prove that, or how would we show that this set X, this constraint set X, is convex? Yeah, no, you always answer all the questions. Somebody else who doesn't answer any question, who wants to give it a shot? Come on, it's not a very difficult problem, and you can be wrong here in the classroom. You should. Just, the only thing you should attempt is not be wrong in the final exam. Okay, everywhere else you can be wrong. The, the, the penalty for being wrong is zero in classroom and is only a little bit in assignments, but in final exam it's really going to pinch you if you make a mistake. So make a mistake here. Sorry? So we have a sample in, of the sample X. Yeah. Right. Okay, a times x one plus. Right. So let's look at this point. X equal to a of x one plus one minus a of x two. Okay. So is is x greater than? So we know that x one and x two satisfy both these constraints. So now what we have to check is whether this x satisfies these two constraints or not. So remember, a is in 0, 0,1, close set 0, 0,1. So is this x greater than or equal to 0? OK, so it is greater than or equal to 0 because a is positive, x1 is positive, 1 minus a is positive, x1 is posi uh, x2 is positive. Okay. So this is greater than or equal to 0. So first constraint is met. Let's look at the second constraint. Uh, 1 transpose xi, 1 transpose x equals to a, 1 transpose x1 plus 1 minus a, 1 transpose x2. Does this add up to r? It adds up to r, right? So therefore, this convex combination of x1 and x2 is in this set, is in the set, and therefore it's a it's a convex set. So answer is yes, because a x1 plus 1 minus a x2 belongs to x, because for every x1 x2 in x, a in 
0 1 ax 1 plus 1 minus ax 2 lies in x itself okay so it's a convex set so this becomes an optimization problem over a convex set so that's why it's a constrained optimization problem but the constraint set itself is convex okay so what would be the what would be so any question on this no so now we will look at uh, what are the what, what is the reasonable choice of this delay function so in many cases it is the delay is or let me write it here d of x is equal to summation of ij and then some weight dij summation of xp where p p is a path and p containing path p containing the edge ij so look at the traffic along each of these edges multiply it by the weight of that edge and then add it up okay it's a linear it's a linear uh, delay function okay but if you're looking at traffic for instance there is it doesn't satisfy this linear condition okay so the traffic whenever you increase the number of cars on a specific road uh, the the delay is going to remain uh, constant I mean there is no I mean it takes some time for you to get from point A to point B on a road so the delay remains constant uh, or the time to travel remains constant and then it decreases decreases rapidly after that because you have more congestion in the traffic okay so not all the time you have such nice delay function okay any question yeah so you sum up all xp that is going through path ij okay so let's look at the path 1 and 2 okay path from 1 to 2 so which traffic is passing through 1 and 2 so x1 and x2 so you multiply d12 to x1 plus x2 then you multiply d23 with only x2 and then you multiply d35 with x2 plus x3 and so on okay so each of these edges have weight you add up whatever traffic is on that edge and then you uh, combine everything linearly d is the weight dij is the weight any other question okay so let's go back to the proof of necessary condition so we introduced the necessary condition in the previous class so let's let's do the proof so the theorem was if uh, x star is optimal or local minimum then gradient of f at x star transpose x minus x star is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in x so if I want to draw a picture
this is my constraint set X. I am claiming that this is my X star and I am claiming that this is my gradient of F at X star and I pick any point X here. I want the inner product between these two vectors to have a positive value. Okay, so let's look at the proof. So let pick pick. So what's the proof idea? I'm standing at x star, and I'm going to move a little bit in some other direction, but within the constraint set. Okay. So how do I move inside the constraint set? I pick an x in x and epsilon greater than 0. Okay? So epsilon would be my step size and I am going to move in the direction of x minus x star. Okay? So I am going to move in this direction okay? but with a small step size. So I will probably be somewhere here. And I am going to prove it by contradiction. Uh, assume that gradient of f x star transpose x minus x star is strictly less than 0. Okay? For, this, for this choice of x, I'm going to assume that this is strictly less than 0. Now, let's look at the value of the function at this point. So this is this point, x star plus epsilon x minus x star. Okay, so this is equal to I'm going to apply Taylor series. So this is equal to f of x star plus Okay, so I'm applying Taylor series. So the evaluate. So I, if I want to evaluate the function at this point, it's the function value at x star plus the gradient at a point between this point and this point. Okay, so s is some number. S is some number between zero and one. Okay, multiplied by this epsilon x minus x star. So is this is this part clear to everyone? This comes from what is known as mean value theorem. Have all of you heard of mean value theorem? Right. So it comes from mean value theorem. Uh, what is mean value theorem? G of x equals or G of x plus d equals mean value theorem g of x plus d equals g of x plus gradient of g x plus s d transpose d s is in 0 comma 1. So that's mean value theorem. You might have studied uh, mean value theorem for a single variable but it works the same for multivariate case. You do need the gradient of g to be a continuous function. Okay, that's all you need. But of course, in these cases, we are all assuming smooth functions. So function is continuous, the differentiation of function is continuous, the second derivative is continuous, and so on. Okay, so we have that property, mean value theorem property here. Now, my question is, Uh, if my 
gradient of f of x star transpose x minus x star is strictly, strictly negative, what would this be? What would the sign of this, this variable be? So my question is, if this is strictly negative, what would the sign of this be? Apply continuity. Negative. Who said negative? Why do you answer always, uh, all the time? I want the answer from someone else. You need to choose a proper epsilon to make it negative. I mean, you, you are assuming epsilon to be a small number. Yeah, it's, it's, it's positive, but it's very small. Epsilon in electrical engineering is always very small. Okay, it never takes large values. You never see epsilon going to infinity. <laughs> Even though you can, you can have a problem where, uh, anyways. Uh, okay, so epsilon is a small number here, and s is something between zero and one. So s epsilon is also a small number. Okay, so if, uh, if gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star is strictly less than zero, then gradient of fx star plus s epsilon x minus x star, which is somewhere here, okay, that transpose x minus x star will also be strictly negative. So this is strictly less than f of x star, and this is by continuity. Okay, so. What am I saying? If f of x is strictly less than 0, then f of x prime is also going to be less than 0 for x prime in a small neighborhood of x prime in small neighborhood of x. Okay, so that's the idea. I'm using here. It's it's okay if you're not introduced to these ideas before. Uh, you can pick up these uh, these tidbits of information in this class and use it to impress your advisor. Okay, <laughs> if at all he gets impressed by those uh, <laughs> those inequalities. So anyways, so what we have showed is if this condition holds true then I can move in this direction and I can reduce my cost. Okay, What does that imply? That implies that x star is not a local minimum. right? Because if I move along this direction, I'm reducing my cost, so x star, so this implies x star is not local minimum. Okay, so our hypothesis that this should be strictly less than zero is wrong, and so the gradient of f x star has to make uh, has to have a positive inner product with x minus x star. Is that clear? Everybody is lost in analysis. Okay, you know this uh, this these techniques. Uh, you can master these techniques if you take a course in real analysis, which is what I tell everyone, but nobody takes real analysis. Okay, that's a shame. Uh, but, but if you take math 5201, you will master all these techniques and then you will feel uh, this is a very easy class. By the way, the, the field of optimization is deeply rooted in the field of real analysis and functional analysis. So if you want to make your career in optimization and design new algorithm, you should definitely consider, I mean, you should take my advice seriously and take Math 5201 uh, to learn all these tools and techniques of uh, algorithm design and analysis. Okay. So the sufficient condition we had is if assume f from x to r 
is convex then x star is optimal or minimum global minimum if and only if gradient of f at x star transpose x minus x star is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in capital X. Okay, so that gives us global optimality. Yeah. For this one or for that one? Uh, I mean, we are doing. I mean, we are doing something similar, and this is just more rigorous way of saying what you have said in words. Okay, uh, but this is what this is what we are proving here. In fact, uh, uh, what I should say is we are proving the contrapositive statement. Uh, but uh, how many of you know what a contrapositive statement means? What is the meaning of a contrapositive statement? No one? Okay, so A implies B, not B implies not A. Okay, so A implies B is a statement, not B implies not A is a contrapositive statement, and these two statements are equivalent. Uh, okay, if you didn't understand it, it's fine. Okay, there's there's no problem. Uh, but uh, but to answer his question, what we are proving is a contrapositive statement here. Even though we are calling it a proof by contradiction, you can actually remove the proof by contradiction part and just prove the contrapositive statement, and that would work. And your idea is exactly the contrapositive statement of the of the theorem. Okay. So, so now we want to prove the global minimality. So, how do I prove it? Remember, f of x is greater than or equal to f of x star plus gradient f of x star transpose x minus x star. Right? That's the definition of convexity. And that's uh, greater than or equal to f of x star. Okay, this was the simplest proof in this entire class. Okay, two line proof. Okay, any question? No? So let's see what this, uh, this result tells us for a specific case when you have what is known as box constraint. So what is box constraint? So I want to consider this problem, minimize f of x such that alpha i is less than or equal to x i is less than or equal to beta i. Okay, so what what is the picture I want you to have in mind? So this is the the picture for three dimensions okay and each of my xi so they say this one is x1 this one is x2 this one is x3 okay it's bounded by a, a, a cuboid kind of region 
where these alpha i and beta i will tell you exactly what the size of the cuboid is. Okay, so this is known as box box. So suppose I I say that this point here is an optimal point x star. So what do we know about so if x star is optimal, then gradient of f at x star transpose x minus x star will be strictly no will be greater than or equal to zero, right? That's what we know from the optimality condition or the necessary condition for optimality. So let me take I can pick x such that so let me define x to be x1 star x2 star and x3 star plus 1 or uh, plus some small number plus delta okay so delta is another number in electrical engineering that's always small okay much smaller than you think 10 raised to minus 16 or something okay so very small number so what do we get by evaluating this so let's evaluate that Oh, by the way, let me assume that x3 star is alpha 3. Okay, so my x3 star is alpha 3. Uh, sorry? Why? I'm, uh, I'm just, I just want to make sure that when I add positive al positive delta here i don't go out of the bounds i can't be outside of beta i so i want to be at alpha i alpha 3 so that i can see what happens when x3 is equal to alpha 3 at uh, at the optimal point so what do i have what is gradient of fx star transpose x minus x star this is del f by del x1 del f by del x2 0 0 and delta okay this is positive what that gives me is del f over del x3 evaluated at x star is greater than or equal to 0 if x3 star is equal to alpha is equal to alpha 3 <coughs> Okay, so let's now assume that x star 2 equals to beta 2. Okay, so now what can I do? I'll pick an x such that it is equal to x1 star and x3 star, but I'll consider x to be beta 2 minus delta. Okay, and I'm going to evaluate this inner product. What is this equal to? Minus delta del f by del x2. And I want it to be greater than equal to zero. What does this imply? Okay, so if you look at this expression, this implies that del f over del x2 evaluated at x star should be less than or equal to zero. Okay, so we get so we get these kind of conditions. Uh, by using the result, by using the necessary condition, and then this becomes the necessary conditions for 
a boxed <laughs> constraint set uh, or, or an optimal point over a boxed constraint set. Okay, so what do we have? What's the overall result? So we can summarize it this way. Del f over del x i evaluated at x star is equal to, no, not is equal to, is greater than equal to 0 if x i star is equal to alpha i is less than equal to 0 if x i star is equal to beta i and is equal to 0 otherwise. Okay, so you can devise your own necessary, so this becomes a necessary condition for optimality. Okay, if you have a box set, if you have, if you're minimizing a function over a set of this type, right, and someone claims that x star is an optimal solution, you can quickly check whether these conditions are satisfied or not, and you can give him a certificate that says that this is a candidate optimal solution, or this is not a candidate optimal. This is certainly not an optimal solution, okay. <coughs> you still have to go through the, sec the, through the sufficient condition to prove that this is indeed optimal, okay? And if the function is non-convex, then good luck, okay? You don't have a second order sufficiency condition here to guarantee that uh, you are a local minimum or something for a non-convex function, okay? Any question on that? No? Okay, so what's our goal in constrained optimization? So we want to go through the same idea. We want to come up with an algorithm that can compute this optimal point in this convex, in this convex region. Okay, so we want to start, so we have this function over this convex region. Okay, and we start with an arbitrary point x naught and we want to come up with an algorithm that can descend okay to arrive at x star okay so this is the kind of algorithm we want to define so how should we go about doing it i, I want ideas now i want ideas for constrained optimization problem, okay? We have seen what happens in, in non unconstrained optimization problem. So I want you to think for a couple of minutes about how, we, how would you go about solving this class of problem where you have a constrained set. Ideas. Yeah. So, sorry, it's obvious that there's boundary conditions. Right. right. Yeah. That should be the first thing. Uh, what do you mean that there are boundary conditions? I mean, there is a boundary here, and you cannot go out of the boundary. Cannot go out of the boundary. So, how would you design an algorithm that doesn't go out of the boundary? <laughs> You are very close, okay? You just have to think a little bit extra. You can add one more term at the boundary. Punishment, okay. So you want to punish the algorithm for going out of the boundary. Okay, uh, that's a good idea, but we won't explore it here. Uh, that that will come in third chapter, which is, you know, we are still at the second chapter. <laughs> no, but that's that's an idea we will explore, you know, but one month later. Um, 
No, why? Uh, okay, I want to minimize x square x in minus 1, 1. Okay. Now we can just try to search the boundary. Okay. So the idea, so his idea is if we are inside, we use gradient descent. If we are at the boundary, then? Okay. Okay. So another idea is to move along the boundary. So if we reach the boundary, so we use gradient descent inside, but if we reach the boundary, then we move along the boundary. How do we move along the boundary? Okay, so suppose my constraint set is norm of x less than or equal to 1. Okay, so it's a sphere of uh, radius 1. And I've reached the boundary. And now my gradient descent is telling me to go out of boundary. Okay, so I have, this is my sphere. I've reached here, this is my xk. And my gradient descent says I should move in this direction. Okay, this is minus gradient of fx star. That's right. So what we can do is we reach here, which is out of the set. What we can do is we can go to the nearest point, which is in the set. Okay, And this going to the nearest point is known as projection. Okay, so we can go here, and this step is known as projection. Okay. So the idea is, I'm going to use gradient descent inside the set as long as I'm not going out of the boundary. As soon as I go out of the boundary, I take an additional step, and that additional projection onto the set. Okay, and I project this point that is outside to a point within the set, and then use the gradient use gradient descent again. Okay, and then again I'll go out of the set. Then again, I'm going to project. I'll come here. And then again, I'm going to do gradient descent and project and so on. And then I will reach x star eventually. So we are traveling along the boundary. But there is an additional step involved, which is projecting onto the set. So that's the idea. So our next result that we want to talk about is projection theorem. Uh, but any questions so far? Yes. So we need the gradient of the boundary, right? What do you mean you need the gradient? To project, and what are we projecting? How are we projecting? Okay, so we have this, x, or rather zk plus 1 equals xk minus, let's say, alpha k gradient fxk. Okay, and this zk plus 1 has gone out of the boundary. Okay, so now what I want to do is project. So I want to say that xk plus 1 is projection of zk plus 1 over x. Okay, so there is this additional step when you are doing constraint optimization. Uh, you see, so, so that's a difficult problem. If you are in a hyperplane, okay, you can go in any of these directions. Okay, so your idea makes sense. If you are on the surface of sphere, no matter what gradient you take of the surface itself, it's always going to go out of the surface. Okay, so it depends on what the curvature of the surface is. And yeah, there was a question here. No? Okay. So what is projection? So we define z as a projection. So projection of z onto the set x is defined as minimum uh, over all x in capital X of norm z minus x square.
Okay. So what is the projection? I have set. I have this point outside the set, and I want to find a point x within this set that is closest to z. This is my projection. Okay, I want to find the point x in the set that is closest to z. So what's the result? What's the theorem? The theorem says for every z in Rn, there exists a unique x star such that This is statement number one. Then we have statement sp statement number two. So projection of z is equal to x star if and only if z minus x star transpose x minus x star is always less than equal to 0 for all x in x. Okay. So what is the picture? The picture is I have the set x. I have this point z and I have this point x star and a point x. So what is z minus x star? That is this vector. What is x minus x star? That is this vector. And what is the saying? The projection of z is equal to x star if and only if the inner product is less than or equal to 0. Okay? The inner product is less than or equal to 0, which means that the angle between these two vectors has to be greater than 90 degree. And this should hold true for all x in x. Okay? So this should be true for all x in x. Then the third statement is, oh, The third statement is the distance between the projected points will always be less than or equal to the distance between the original points. Okay, so let's look at the picture. Okay, so what's the distance between the original point? That's this distance. What's the distance between the projected points? That's this distance. Okay, so this distance has to be less than or equal to this distance. And the fourth result is So my x is x in Rn such that ax is equal to 0, then x star if and only if 
z minus x star transpose x is equal to 0 for all x in x. Okay, so this is known as subspace. So what is the picture I want you to have in mind? So anyone knows what a subspace looks like in Rn? What is a subspace in Rn? Anyone? No, not really. <laughs> okay, so a subspace in Rn is either a line passing through origin or it's a plane, it's a hyperplane passing through origin. Okay, yeah. Well, so it's called a hyperplane. Okay, so it's a, it's either a hyperplane or it's a line through origin or a hyperplane through origin. Okay, so yes, in three you will call it a plane. In three dimensional you will call it a plane, but in higher dimensional you call it a hyperplane. Okay, so that's what this subspace means. But it has to pass through origin. That's the most important property that you should remember. That's what a subspace means. If you move the hyperplane away from the origin, do you know what it is called? A fine Sorry? A fine. a fine hyperplane. I don't know. <laughs> it's called a linear variety. Okay, it's called a linear variety if you move it away from the origin, but if you are at the, if it is passing through the origin, then it is known as subspace. And so, when you are, if your x is a subspace, then the projection of a point, so this is my, this is my subspace, and I have z here. So the projection of z, which is your x star, has to make a right angle with every point, with every uh, vector x within the within the set okay that's what this equality means so any question so far no so in the next class we'll talk a little bit more about projection we'll look at a few examples of projection so for instance if you are if you have a sphere that's your constraint set and you want to project a point that is outside the sphere anyone knows what you can do how do you project a point outside the sphere? You just scale it so that it, it is sitting right at the surface of the sphere. Okay, so we'll look at some of those examples of projection and then we'll talk about uh, gradient projection methods and other methods for constrained optimization. Thank you.